You're in the right place at the right time. <laughs> Better is one day in your courts, Lord, than a thousand elsewhere, right? So to be here and to spend this time with each other with the Word of God is right where you need to be. There is no greater benefit that you could have gotten being anywhere else. You might have woken up tired and you're like, ugh, out of habit came here, but you're going to get a ton out of it because it's, you get exponentially, you receive exponentially more being here together with the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. All right, so today we're going to touch the, the tip of the iceberg. We're going to talk about loving one another. And uh, that's something that, let's be real, we're going to spend the rest of our time on earth and in heaven practicing and learning how to do in a very real and practical way. And what does that mean? Love is so vast. God himself, our Father, is love. And you can't reach the end of him and you can't reach the end of love. And so to learn how to do that one with another is always beneficial for us. We, we hear it, but our hearts are open and we're going to receive so much from the Lord today. Amen? Amen. All right, so we're going to start with this scripture. I'm going to There we go. All right, so this is Jesus in John 13, and he says, By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you perform signs and wonders. No. If you have new revelations of the word every single day. No. If you are wealthy and successful in every way, shape, and form. No. Are those all associated with being a disciple of Christ? Certainly. Absolutely. That comes. But Jesus chose one thing to say. This, by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So there's something to be said that if Jesus chose that out of everything he could have said, right? So to understand how important it is that he's telling us to do this and to live by this, I want to give us a little bit of context. So that was John 13. So we're going to jump back to John 12 for a little bit and work our way through. So the context of John 12, right before Jesus says this, is he is aware that he's about to die. He is aware that he is about to go through the worst part of his life. He is aware that he has come to fulfill the very reason that he came on this earth for, to be crucified, to endure separation from the Father for our sake. So this is a heavy place the Lord is in, okay? So he says, Jesus himself says, Now my soul is troubled. It's agitated. I'm restless. I'm anxious. I'm perplexed. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. So we know that the Lord is here saying this with urgency. There is a pressure on him. There is this angst within him. And it says that he cried out to the people that were around him. He was with his disciples and other listeners. And to say that he cried out is that he shrieked. He screamed. He, there was a lot of pressure building on the inside of him when in John 12 as we're working our way to John 13 when he tells us to love one another, right? So I'm going to read just a few key verses of John 13, working our way up. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. We're going to stop right there for a second. Knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. Has the Father given you all things into your hands? Yes. You're a part of Christ. The promises tell us he has, yes? Have you come from God? You've been born again of the Spirit. You've been born again of God, right? That's the whole point of behind being born again. So, yes. And are you going to God? Yeah, eventually you are, right? So you know all these things. We're talking about, I'm from God, I'm going to God, everything's been given to me. And you would think that's a very elevated place to be. And yet the next verse, what does Jesus do? Rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So from this place of, I know why I'm here, I know that my father has literally given me everything, uh, I know that I'm not limited, and the next thing he does is, 
lay it all down, puts aside his garment and physically, literally washes his disciples' feet. So then I have to ask you, in washing feet, what position was Jesus in, physically speaking? He was underneath. He was beneath the disciples. He was at their feet. At their feet. And, and Val spoke to us recently about obedience. And one of the definitions of to obey is to listen from under. So there's this position that Jesus physically, literally took, but then it's also the attitude of our heart, right? It's this place of, I'm under the members of the body of Christ, right? To serve, to love. So Jesus did it literally here, so obviously we're to follow that example. And then earlier in this, I think it was this year, the end of last year, to wash each other's feet is the dust, all just the garbage that collects throughout the week as we're living our lives and going to work and dealing with emotions and this and that. And we come together and we're like, hey, what's going on in your life? What dust have you got on our feet? What can I pray with you? And let's just... Let's just wash that off. Let's just that renew our minds, set each other back on track, and keep moving forward with what Christ has for us, right? So listening from under, serving from under. We are over the devil, his demons, the powers and principalities of darkness. But regarding one another in the body of Christ, we are under one another. That's really key. When it has to do with the enemy and taking dominion and having the power that he's given us, absolutely, we are raised and seated. We are above every other name that can be named because we're in Jesus' name. But when we look at one another and we regard one another, I'm under you. And I'm under you for what purpose? To lift you up, right? You, you know, you, we movies and people helping each other climb over a wall. They put their hands in, okay, step on my hand and jump over, right? I'm under you to build you up into the fullness of the stature of Christ. That's my attitude when I look at you. So we're over the devil, but we're under one another in the body of, in, in the body of Christ. And I love it, like, when I think of the physical anatomy of our bodies and the way our Father um, created us, and you look at diagrams, every organ and part is kind of nestled under the under the, the other piece you know you have bones in sockets and you have organs sitting under other organs it's just this like coming right up next to it. and so i imagine if we're members of christ's body somehow that takes form we come up under each other and uh christian from california that's always with us hi christian um, but is with us every so often and, and shares the word with us he uh, showed us that picture of the bricks in a wall being perfectly knit together and formed together, right? Not having sharp edges, but being corroded and, and, um, and filed down until every brick fit together. And, and that's, that's what we are, and that's what Christ is creating in us, through us being his body. So then he goes on. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and he sat down again, he said th to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I, then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Black and white. Jesus didn't just metaphorically wash feet. He literally washed feet. And so that's a place for us to be like, okay, to serve one another, to love my brothers and sisters, is to literally do something. And it's also an attitude of my heart, how I regard, when I speak, when I encourage, when I correct, right? Where does it come from? What's my purpose? If it's to lift you up, then that's how you measure what it is in my, that I'm giving to you. Is it a value to you? Is it a value to the body of Christ? And Jesus continues, most assuredly, I say to you, a servant, a servant, because Jesus in this moment was taking the form of a servant, right? That is the position he was in. He was not operating as a king right now. He was operating as a servant. A servant is not greater than his master. Jesus saying, I'm not greater than my father, right? Nor is he who is sent, I, Jesus, have been sent, greater than he who sent him. My father sent me. Same idea. If he showed us that example, the same applies for us. We, don't, we can't be any better of a servant than Jesus can, right? Jesus has demonstrated the perfect attitude and heart and display of what a servant looks like. So we, we should be imitating him. There's no more we can add to his example of being a servant. If you know these things, blessed are you if you meditate on them. Blessed are you if you theorize them. Blessed are you if you philosophize them. 
No, blessed are you if you do them. Do them, act, act, take action, right? And um, again, we were reminded a few weeks ago of, of Jesus talking about he who hears my words and does them is the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. The one who hears it and that's all, he just builds his house on the sand. And we don't want that. We want to be rock solid, built on the rock. And that's why we take his word and we put it into practice. At the beginning, if this is new, yeah, you're going to fumble. It's going to look awkward. But who cares? You know your attitude. You know your position. That we're, you want to conform to the image of Christ. We want to be conformed to the image of Christ. So it's okay. That's why there's grace one for another. We're trying to figure this out. We're trying to, to put it into practice, make it real, make it alive, because this is the sign that the world will know that we're his. We're going to do signs and wonders. We have been, we are, we will continue to do them. We'll continue to um, have success and prosperity in our businesses, in our families. And that, that is all well and good. And yet the thing the Lord is really emphasizing is love one another, right? It's in his state of agitation that he's just like, come on, you guys, please get with me on this. Goes on. So the next set of verses, Jesus is talking about Judas, his betrayer. He takes bread, Judas leaves. And then again, when Jesus had said these things about Judas, he was troubled. The same trouble we saw earlier, agitated. He was restless, anxious. So in this really intense place, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, right? Can you just imagine? It's this kind of heaviness of heart. It's this urgency on the Lord. He's like, please, um, just let me give you one more thing. My time is short. I can only say a few things before I go, and I'm leaving you with this. I'm giving you a new commandment. Love one another. Love one another. As I have loved you, you also love one another. And how has he loved us? He just showed. He laid down his garment, he took a basin, and he literally washed their feet. As I have loved you, love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Not for the unsaved, not for the lost, not for those that you're witnessing to. Again, that's all true, and you should, and we do, and, and we're walking that out. And yet the Lord is specifying the sign that people will know that you're mine and parts of me and members of my body and that you are God on earth is by the way you love one another, how we love one another. And love is not just this theoretical thing, right? It, yes, it is agape love, but it's brotherly affection. It's just the real nitty gritty of how do I interact with you? What is my attitude towards you? And listen, you guys, when I, when I was, was th thinking about, okay, Lord, well, here, it's my turn to serve the body. What is it that you know you want me to, to bring? And thinking about it, and then this kind of popped up in my face a little later. I'm like, <laughs> me? Whoa, Lord, like I've been working on this seed for like six months to a year. I'm, you know, we do our prayer walks. I'm confessing. I am patient. I am kind. Had a, you know, I'm working it out. This fruit is not ripe in me yet. And so I, f I felt like Moses. You, you want me to? You want me to talk about this? So, because, you know, among us, there's f f different fruit that's ripened in different parts of us, and we eat from each other. And so I kind of laughed, and I'm like, Lord, if you're going to ask your people, like, who comes to mind when you say love? It ain't going to be me. Like, it's going to be Val. It's going to be Claude, you know? And so, but I'm like, hey, he uses all of us in different ways for a purpose. And we, and we trust his leadership, and we trust when he says I want you to open your mouth. So that applies for me. That applies for every single one of you. Do not disregard yourself. He doesn't disregard you. He doesn't regard you according to the flesh. So don't regard yourself according to the flesh. And we don't regard each other according to the flesh either, right? So by this, you all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Again, the Lord choosing his words very carefully, very specifically, because he knew he only had a few moments left. The rest of chapter 13 uh, is Peter and his denial, and the Lord says three times, you'll deny me. So then we switch over to chapter 14, and then he says, let not your heart be troubled. <laughs> Don't let your heart be agitated. So he kind of lifts the mood. He's like, okay, this is getting intense. I left you with this. Now we're going to come out of it. And then he talks about all, all kinds of other things in chapter 14, and then we're going to jump into 15 a little bit. So talks about, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Verse 9, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, 
you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This is my commandment, right? So he says, if you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. Well, here it is. This is my commandment. And not, this is my suggestion. This is not my strong encouragement to you. This is not my warning, my commandment, my order, my decree. I'm a general in the army. If I say it, this is what's going to happen, right? This is my commandment. So there's force in this, that you love one another as I have loved you. Again, how did he just love them? He just served them. He had just washed their feet. Greater love has no one or nothing than this. Greater love. There's not a more splendid love. There's not a more grand love. There's not a more abundant love. You can't express love in any greater way than the following. Lay down your life for your friend. So it's not, we're not talking about just an affection or a feeling, though that is part of it. But the greatest way that you can express love for your brother or sister in Christ is to lay down your life for their sake, for them to be lifted up. I lay down that you may be lifted up, right? It's the height of love. It's the greatest expression of being able to love another. And I included just the passion and weast of the same verse just to gain a, a better understanding of it. For the greatest love of all is a love that sacrifices all. And this great love is demonstrated when a person sacrifices his life for his friends. Greater love than this, no one has. Namely, that anyone lay down his life on behalf of his friends. To lay down, to themi. And I put in parentheses earlier, I just find it a, a divine coincidence, if you will, that it's the same word that it's said about Jesus when he laid down his garment before he washed the feet. It's the same verb of laying down. So to lay down, it's to put down, to put something down. You're wearing or you're carrying something and then you put it down. You are no longer wearing or carrying. To bend down, to kneel, to sink down, right, under. There's this position of under. To place in a passive or a horizontal posture. It's the same word that says Jesus was laid in his tomb, right? And he literally gave his life literally right he died that we might have life so all these expressions and definitions of laying down what i'm trying to highlight here is that it's an intentional choice we make it's an act that you do to put something down to no longer carry something um to bend down to kneel down so in an, a choice and an act that we make with intention regarding one another and what are you laying down what are you putting down your life, which is your literal life, your very breathing, your existence, like Christ did, right? Literally gave his life, take a bullet for someone. But then also to put down your psyche, which we've heard many times here, it's, it's a word that describes the soul, like psychological, right? And so this includes so much, but in essence, it's to lay down your feelings. But I feel so strongly about this, I'm so passionate about this, I insist, I insist, da 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 lay it down if it lifts the other one up desires but i want to do this but i don't feel like doing that i want to do that no nah, nah, nah. lay it down if it's going to lift the other one up lay it down affections that which is most dear to me i want this but i can't this is so precious to me let it go lay it down for the sake of your brother or sister to lay down your will <laughs> that's fun isn't it we're all we're all enjoying that lesson and and it, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but it becomes easier because we are becoming love. We already are love because we're born of God, the spirit who is love. But in our soul, we are being conformed to his image. And um, there's a passage in Hebrews that talks about um, those that are mature in the Lord um, are mature because of constant exercise and by constant exercise, being able to discern good from evil. And so there's, it seems rather simple and rather, okay, Lord, but that's not so divine. That's not so spiritual. But we do this by practicing, really. The opportunity you have to lay down your will for the sake of another, okay, well, here goes nothing, you know. It might be a fingernail of your will, but it's something. It counts, right? It's the demonstration of love. And then the laying down of, of your thoughts as well. Well, my logic says this. My reason says this. That doesn't make any sense, right? And, and that was that was brought to us recently when we talked about obedience 
and the fact that to obey is not to reason it out, not to logic it out. Well, that doesn't match my logic, but because I regard Christ in you and I honor Christ, I submit. I am under. I am listening from under. I am receiving from this position of being under you. And um, there's a quote, and I think a lot of us have heard it, don't know where it comes from. Uh, but in essence, it says, true humility um, is not thinking less of yourself, right, in value. I'm not worth any less, but thinking of yourself less. And it's what, what Val started us off with, right? It's not being as so much self-centered, but becoming more and more God-aware, becoming more and more member-aware, right? Like, as we walk and as we move, I'm not... I'm a liver. What's the liver doing? But like, oh, the liver has to do this and do that. What's going on with you guys? You know, so it's our gaze is turning from self-awareness to whole body awareness, member awareness. What parts are around me? What's going on here? Um, and so to lay it down, that's all well and great. But what does that accomplish? What in my laying down, what does that produce? And the key and what you're looking for when you lay your life down is to lift the other one up. It's as simple as that. Into the fullness of the stature of Christ. Because that's our goal. That's, that's what we're all aiming for in all of our life as we're walking and as we're doing and as we're going through trials. We're all working on being conformed to the image of Christ, right? So if I'm doing that, then I trust that that's literally what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life, in your life, in your life. And bearing that in mind, if there's a place that by laying my life down, Christ is edified in you, then yes, that is love. And there's so many examples. And like I said, to talk about this this morning is, is, to, is just to touch on it because it's love we're talking about. I mean, this is an unending subject. And, um, but I trust the Holy Spirit will definitely give you examples and quicken it to you when that opportunity is right there and that moment is there for you to lay down your life for the sake of his or her benefit, right? So... Um, laying it down to lift the other one up. And literally, this is what Christ did to the maximum extent. He said, if the seed does not die, he being the seed, if I don't go into the ground and if I don't die, lay out my life, pour out my life, then more grain can't grow, right? More sons can't come into glory. Brethren can't be added to the family of my father. So that is what he did. He showed us what that means and what that looks like. Lay it down because so much increase comes on the other end of it. Because think about it, it's not just your increase. Literally all the members grow then. You have this awareness of Christ in me multiplying again and again and again and again and again and again. And that's unstoppable. That glory is unstoppable. That, that power is unstoppable, right? Um, and then we're going to jump to Philippians. So... <laughs> Uh, when I, I was looking for a particular verse, which you guys will see in a moment here, um, one that we talk a lot about here, and it's, it's been super edifying for us in our identity in Christ. And when I saw the context it was in, I was like, whoa, okay. So that's, you're going to get a little a pleasant surprise here this morning. So this is Philippians uh, chapter 2. We're going to look at eight verses here, are the, the first set. So Paul is talking, and he's, giving, he's starting with these conditional statements. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, do we have comfort and consolation in Christ? Check. Okay. Criteria met. Okay. If there is any comfort of love, have, do we have that in him? Okay. We've met that piece of criteria as well. If any fellowship of the Spirit, we have that. Check. If any affection and mercy in being in him, absolutely. So since we've met all these requirements, then the following applies. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Fulfill Christ's joy, because this is Christ through Paul speaking, right? Fulfill my joy by being what? Being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, being of one mind. So there's nothing that hinders us from fulfilling this, right? Um, the fact that he set it up for us, all of that is true. Therefore, we can fulfill the Lord's joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in the lowliness of mind. Yeah, the lowliness of mind under you, positioning myself, not let me prove to you, let me demonstrate to you, let me explain to you because I got it. Lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out 
not only for his own interests, so that's not bad, right? You have things you got to do. You got things you need to take care of. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. Take into consideration what's going on with so-and-so, what's going on there, how can I help, how can I benefit, how can I serve, because to serve them in that way is to very, very practically love them, whether that's your time, money, encouragement, prayer, doing an errand, except, or correction, or, or holding, your, holding your tongue. You know, it, it, it all comes from this place of, if I lay this down, does it lift the other one up? So again, that true humility, not, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, your value, it's simply thinking of yourself less. Philippians goes on, verse five, let, and here, here's the verse that we're like, oh yeah, let this mind be in you. This is the mind of Christ, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. So this, he, literally he's saying, here we go, this is the mind of Christ. He, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Have we been born again in the form and image of God? We have. In that case, it is not robbery for us to say that, Father, I am equal with you. In my nature, in my existence, in my value, in my being, I am equal with you. So here we are, top of the world, ruling and reigning, raised and seated, and then verse 6, but... And I think all of us have been through elementary school and learned some basic English, and the word but kind of changes the direction of everything you just read before, <laughs> right? So, in the form of God, not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a king. No. Taking the form of a bondservant, which is a willing servant, right? Not just a servant that you've been uh, purchased, right? Uh, yeah, you look like a good piece of property, like in the olden days with slavery. You're mine, you can't say anything about it. We're talking about a bondservant, which is you've served me seven years, year of jubilee, you're free to go, choose what you want. You can go free or not. And the servant says, you know what, you've been a really good master, I'm choosing to stay. Pierced ear, they're with that family for the rest of their life. Taking the form of a willing servant, willingly, willingly and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man and again you guys to describe christ is to describe us right we are here on this earth in the likeness of men we have skin we're in a physical body we're found in the appearance of man and christ humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of a cross so this is the height of identity, the height of glory, knowing who he is, which is so wonderful that that's what has been established in us. I think that's all of us can say, being a part of Celebration City, the Lord has so lifted us up to say, you, you are quite something, actually. I'm God. I'm your father. You're not born of blood. You're not born of the will of man anymore. You're not born of the flesh. You're born of God himself. So I think you regard me quite highly, so you should regard yourself quite highly, right? So that's been so established in us, and I praise the Lord for that. And now the Holy Spirit's working to say, the more you have in Christ, the greater you see yourself in Christ, the more you can serve the body. The greater your crown it is to lay it down. And uh, uh, Val talked about this recently, and uh, to kind of paraphrase something, some of what he shared with us, only when you know who you truly are and what you truly have can you choose to practice true humility by laying it all down? If you don't think much of yourself, uh, there's not really a lot to lay down, right? It's just logic, that that's not how it works. But the more you see who you are, the more you're like, wow, Lord, you've given me everything. I'm unlimited, I have power, I have love, I have all of this, and now I choose to serve the body of Christ. I choose to love my brothers and my sisters by laying it down. That's, that's humility, that's meekness, that's power that the world cannot even begin to understand. And think about it. The world will know that we're his by the way we practice this with each other. That's so bizarre to the world. That is truly God's nature. That's truly God's life. Because the world is like, look out for number one. Look out for number one. The most that that love extends is me and my family. Kind of ends there. 
I want to have money, my family needs to be good, my kids need to be taken care of. Whatever happens to everyone else, not my problem. And yet the Lord is like, I don't want you guys to love each other that way. I want you to get to the point of, for example, uh, we got Ani and Roxy that have children here as part of our local body. For Ani to regard Roxy and Kosti's children as much as she regards her own. Same, Roxy Kosti, to regard Tavi and Ani's children as much as they regard their own. That there is no more valuable or less valuable in the body of Christ. For that realness of love to take such life and manifestation that we treat each other and interact and regard one another like this all the time. You guys, that's going to be a blinding light in the darkness. That is so different. And then Jesus goes on to say, I think it's in John 17, right, which is just a couple chapters later when he's praying for all of us and his time is about to end. And he's like, and they will know that I was sent by the way they love one another. They will, I mean, we've been doing evangelism. Hey, do you know Jesus? And which is effective. But the Lord is, is taking it one step further. By the way you live this out, people will know that I'm the Messiah. People will have this inherent awareness that, who is this guy? Jesus, this random Jewish man that lived thousands of years ago, and here these people are living their whole life based on what he said, and it like actually affecting them, and like they, they love each other, like real love, not just an imitation, like really, really real love. And that's something that's exceptional, truly divine, divine in nature. So aware and awakened sons are the only ones that can choose, choose, humility. Choose to be a servant. The more you realize your greatness in Christ, the more you lay it down to serve the members of his body that are around you. How do you see faith? And I'll ask this. Does anyone have an idea? Because faith is invisible. It's, it's not a physical thing. So how do you see faith? Through action. Through action. Exactly. Because Jesus said it. And when they could not come near him, Jesus, because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. So we see faith through action. So then, how do you see love? Love is, is vis invisible. How do you see love? God is love. So then, how do you see God? He's a spirit. How do you see him? By fruit. God our Father can physically be seen in this world by how we treat one another, how we regard one another, how we interact with each other. So faith by action, love can be seen by fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit is, or in other words, the multiplication of God looks like love, the first fruit. Looks like joy, looks like peace, uh, peace. looks like patience, looks like long suffering, looks like kindness and goodness faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And the Galatians goes on, against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, which is totally selfish, right? Me, 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 flesh, 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 what do I want, what do I want, what do I want? So right here it's saying very like, hey, hello, those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Tw verse 25, if we live in the spirit, because we live we move, we have our being in him, right? It's a scripture that we meditate on. If we live in the spirit, well then let us also walk in the spirit. Let us also act. Let us also do, right? The spirit is not some abstract, theoretical, somewhere out there, I am in the spirit. Well, you see it by fruit. You see the spirit in you. You see that you're in the spirit by the fruit coming out of your soul. You can't see the spirit. The, the bridge that, that fills in the gap between the invisible and the visible is your soul, is the place where you think, is the place where you decide, is the place where you feel. And that's the gate that all this fruit comes through, love and joy and peace and patience and all of it. So then focusing on love, of course, 1 Corinthians. And I'm going to read a couple of versions because I just want us to meditate on it. This is the word. Word comes or faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And so the most benefit to us is literally the word of God, right? So 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. 
though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and though I have all the faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. Though I bestow all my goods and I feed the poor and I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love is. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself and it's not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not irritated, it's not provoked, it's not annoyed. Love thinks no evil. It doesn't take into account the evil which it suffers. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, it believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. The scripture goes on to say because prophecy will fail, speaking in tongues will end, all of these things will pass, but love will not end. The Passion Translation. If I were to speak with eloquence in earth's many languages and in the heavenly tongues of angels, and yet I didn't express myself with love, my words would be reduced to the hollow sound of nothing more than a clanging cymbal. If I were to have the gift of prophecy with a profound understanding of God's hidden secrets, and if I possessed unending supernatural knowledge, and if I had the greatest gift of faith that could move mountains, but have never learned to love, then I am nothing. And if I were to be so generous as to give away everything that I own to feed the poor and to offer my body to be burned as a martyr without the pure motive of love, I would gain nothing of value. Love is large and it's incredibly patient. Love is gentle and it's consistently kind to all. It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor does it selfishly seek its own honor. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and it finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others that you can have all that Christ wants for you. And this totally ties to Val's message, was it last weekend, about the jealousy of the Lord, the fire of God. No, I'm not backing down because you are better than that. You deserve more than that. Christ suffered, he died, he gave up his breath, he endured being separated from his father, which he had never been ever in the history of eternity. And he did that so that you could step into the fullness. No, I'm not gonna shut up and I'm not gonna leave you alone, right? Love, love, lay it down because you, you can have it all and you should because he purchased it for you. Love never takes failure as a defeat for it never gives up. Try again, try again, try again. Hallelujah. All right, so I'm going to invite you guys to stand up and we're going to confess with our mouths. We love Proverbs and Proverbs. Proverbs tells us that life and death are in the power of our tongue. And because we love it, we're going to eat of its fruit. Um, and before we confess this, I also want to read James. Um, James is one of the passages that talks about the word of God being our mirror, right? And so when we look at a mirror, we see, oh, what we look like, oh, my hair's out of place, I got to adjust that, I got to fix that. So there's that aspect of the, of the word of God being our mirror, and so we can conform to Christ. But then also there's another passage that says, as we behold him as in a mirror, we're transformed from one degree of glory into another, right? So this is to instill hope in our hearts. This is to remind us and get us back on track, loving one another, right? So let's say these words together. As the Father loves you, Jesus, you also love me. I did not choose you, but you chose me and appointed me to bear fruit. I am patient, I am kind, I am not envious or jealous, I do not parade myself 
and my accomplishments. I am not arrogant. I am not rude. I do not seek my own way. I do not insist or demand my own way. I am not easily irritated, and I am not quick to take offense. I am not resentful. I find no delight in what is wrong. I rejoice with others in their gladness. I bear all things, I believe all things, I hope all things, and I endure all things.